um, get going since we only have an hour uh, with Hido. So uh, I'm uh, Rajiv Deheja, I'm at New York University, and many thanks to uh, Dominic uh, Rotenhäusler, uh, Ying Jin, Emma Perkovic, uh, Georgia um, Papa de Georgiou, uh, Ching Guan Zhao for inviting me to today's online causal inference seminar. Um, format will be a little different from usual. Um, Hito Embens, who's one of the uh, co-organizers of the seminar, will find the tables turned on him and he will become the, the subject uh, of, of the proceedings. So through a series of questions uh, proposed um, by, by all of us and which were proposed by some of the seminar participants, we'll get to hear from Hito about some of his early influences, landmark papers, key collaborators, uh, musings on the future and anything else that, that comes up along the way. So I had the pleasure of meeting Hito in 1992, which was my first year um, as a graduate student uh, at Harvard. Uh, and then I took what I believe was the first iteration of the joint uh, course, uh, which Hito taught with Don Rubin on causal inference. Um, and you know, none of us in that class, uh, I think, knew where anything was heading in some ways. You know, we, we, had, we didn't have any foresight in that sense, but I think it was quite clear to all of us that there was something remarkable going on. It was a remarkable, um, confluence of fields, but also a, a, a remarkable collaboration, one which has sort of changed the direction not only of economics, but also of statistics and many, many other uh, related fields. And so um, I, all of us in that room felt lucky to be there. And I certainly was lucky, very lucky to have Hido um, as, as an advisor. It sort of shaped the direction of my career and many others as well. So I think it's a, it's a great pleasure. So welcome, Hido. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to start out the questioning and everybody will sort of take some turns uh, pushing the conversation in different directions. So I actually wanted to start with uh, the early days um, and really sort of, you know, Hedo um, back in the Netherlands, right? So we, we know, we all know you're Dutch, um, but you know, that has a specific significance in the world of economics and econometrics. You, you're now the third Dutch Nobel laureate in economics. Um, is there any sense in which there are some fingerprints of those early days in the direction your work took? Is there a sense in which you sort of feel that there's like a Dutch tradition in empirical work or econometrics that influenced you? Uh, th thanks, uh, Rajiv. Good, good to see you, even if it's not in, uh, in person. Uh, first, let me, let me uh, thank my fellow organizers uh, uh, for the seminar. We started this in, uh, I think, in March uh, 2020, and it's, it's really been a lot of fun doing this i think it's been great for the the field kind of to have have all these different talks uh, uh from different parts of the causal inference uh, world and so I, I really appreciate the, my fellow organizers uh, for doing this uh, and i hope we can continue this for a while um but so, so um as you said i, I start off in the netherlands uh, so in the netherlands the education system is a little different uh, one big difference is you have to choose your college major while you're still in high school so um, rather than just applying for university you apply for a particular program and in holland in some sense it was even worse because econometrics was actually a separate undergraduate uh, degree so i had to to I, I made the decision to study econometrics while i was uh, in my final year in high school so when i was about 17 uh, not really based on on deep insights and in what the field was actually about but i wanted to do something that had a lot of mathematics in it, uh, but I didn't want to do pure mathematics. Uh, in fact, I'd read uh, this short book by, by Tim Berg and uh, my high school economics teacher kind of lent that uh, to me. And that, that seemed a uh, field that kind of fit what I wanted. It had a fair amount of mathematics, uh, had, but it was, was somewhat more uh, relevant for the, the real world. So I, I decided to do that. And that, that program in uh, in Rotterdam was was very good from some perspective. Uh, it wasn't just pure econometrics, but actually it was also doing a fair amount of mathematical economics, doing operations research. But it was very it was incredibly good preparation for going to a US PhD program. The the one thing that was really missing was there was not really much of a focus on empirical work on actually applied economics uh, programs. And so for people who just did that degree. In some sense, it was very narrow. We didn't really learn much, uh, much economics um, at all. But the 
but in terms of of getting us the statistics uh, and the, the econometrics background, it was uh, was particularly uh, uh, useful. And I, I got a lot out of that that program. And in some sense, I kind of I, I st stuck with with the econometrics with the the topics I started off with at that point my whole career. Interesting. So I think one of the other questions is going to circle back to sort of your, your switch to applied work. But let me just sort of continue the the, the, the narrative of, 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 of Hedo for, for one more chapter. Um, so, you know, you were in the Netherlands and then, of course, um, you know, you ended up in Hull in a master's program, which at least on the face of it seems like an unusual choice. And then I also know, but maybe you can remind us a bit of this history um, that, that, you know, Tony Lancaster became involved at that point and you ended up at Brown where he moved. Um, and so just thinking about sort of two pieces, one is like, you know, how did you sort of make those educational choices? Like you did this undergraduate and then you're ending, ending up in Hall and also think talking a little bit about Tony Lancaster. So I had the pleasure of meeting him many years ago, but is there a sense in which um, the way he thought about things um, influenced? Yeah, so, things so, you worked on? so let me first kind of about the, the getting to Hall. There were kind of two things. Uh, when I was in Rotterdam, one, there was, there was this, actually this economist visiting from, uh, from Rochester. Um, and so as part of that visit, he he had to teach a course and he was teaching this course on the, on this very esoteric uh, topic, uh, general equilibrium, which itself is, is sort of, you know, it's a big topic in the 60s in economics, uh, but had become a little esoteric. And then he was doing this, you know, general equilibrium is about how prices get determined kind of in a, in a market with lots of different products. And he was doing, the whole course was about the setting where there were infinitely many goods. And uh, so th there were a couple of students showing up the, the first class, then it kind of soon most people left. And by the third class, there was only me left uh, in the class and a couple of faculty who felt kind of obliged to show up for this, this visitor. But so then, then I got talking to this guy, uh, this professor, Marcus Burley, and, uh, and he was like, well, you know, you should actually think about doing a PhD. Uh, thinking about going to to graduate school and I, I never really thought about that before but that that really got me thinking about it and the second thing was um, um Wilbert van der Klauw, the friend of mine also econometrician there who's now at the New York Fed read about this exchange program with uh, with the University of Hull and so kind of for no particular reason other than that it seemed like an interesting thing to do we we decided to go there uh, initially for a year with the idea of just coming back and finishing a degree but then when we went to Hull uh, Tony Lancaster was there he was very surprised you know he was an econometrician there he never really had a lot of econometric students there and suddenly these two students from uh, from the Netherlands who had a lot of background in econometrics already showed up uh, and so he he got very excited about that he was at the point of leaving for the US to go to, to uh, Brown. And so he asked if we were interested in uh, doing a PhD and both both Wilbert van der Klaar and I decided that actually seemed like uh, an interesting idea again, rather than going back. And so I never actually ended up finishing my degree in, uh, in Rotterdam because we just went straight to Brown and then, then, uh, then did a PhD there. But again, kind of Tony Lancaster there while we were in Hull, kind of really got both of us excited about doing a PhD and, and the fact you know, I, I'd never thought about this. I, I thought that would be something incredibly expensive, but it turns out that's actually feasible. There's, there's lots of financial aid uh, possible. And, and so it just seemed uh, a very interesting idea. Again, not with the idea of staying there in the US forever, but uh, just as, uh, as an uh, interesting experience. Excellent. So I'm going to hand it over to Dominic for the next question. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, friends and uh, mentors. So, yeah, some of your most influential papers have been written together with uh, Josh, Josh Angrist. Uh, last year, you shared part of the Nobel Prize with him on Wikipedia. If the information is correct, he was also a best man at, uh, at your wedding. So I just wanted to ask a bit about the, the story behind that. Can you tell a bit uh, how you got to know each other, how you started collaborating? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so, so I met, so I first met Josh when I gave my uh, job talk at at, uh, at Harvard. So in, in economics, uh, as as many of you know, it's kind of a very organized job market. As people apply, there's interviews at a particular uh, meeting, 
early January, then people do do flyouts. Uh, so I did this. Uh, I gave a uh, job talk at Harvard uh, on uh, response based sampling, choice based sampling. Uh, which was a okay, but it wasn't particularly interesting. Josh didn't like it. And so in fact, he he told me fairly recently uh, um, that he actually he argued they shouldn't hire me because it, he thought it was was uh, wasn't very interesting. At some level, I, I think he was probably right. But the you know, it was a Josh was a first year assistant professor, so they didn't really pay that much attention to his views on the, on these things. So they they uh, Gary Chamberlain who was the senior econometrician there at the time. Uh, was more interested, and so they, they hired me. But then, when I joined that, Josh and I started talking a fair amount. We were, you know, we were more or less in the the same area. We were both relatively new there. Josh has come a year earlier from Princeton, uh, and so we we just started talking a lot about the econometrics problems, about his work, the the draft lottery work, about some of his work uh, with Alan Kruger. We kind of talked, so that, you know, the context was sort of partly the Lima paper, kind of about let's take the con out of econometrics, where there was kind of a lot of concern that the empirical work wasn't all that credible. Josh was very nah, unhappy with the state of econometrics. He felt that a lot of the econometrics work wasn't really very nah, interesting. And uh, and relevant, which included the work I was doing in my thesis. Uh, but so we kind of we we just started talking a lot about what the what the interesting problems were. And it's, you know we were both living in Harvard housing uh, at the time. Harvard had a lot of apartments for junior faculty, uh, but they didn't they didn't come with laundry facilities, so we have to go to the laundromat kind of to to do the laundry, uh, and we'd spend. Saturday morning there sitting waiting for the the laundry and kind of again talking about the what problems we thought were interesting partly at that, that time I wasn't really that focused on on causal questions uh, but Josh had kind of very strong views on what he thought was interesting uh, and you know, he was very persuasive in uh, in, in some of these uh, Arguments and so I started reading more of some of the literature. I looked more at uh, at the work Josh had done, and that's kind of where where we started uh, uh, thinking about uh, collaborating. And that, that's kind of in those conversations we basically laid the groundwork kind of for the early papers, uh, including the the one on the on the local average treatment effect. And so then at the end of that first year, Josh actually left to take a position um, at the University of Jerusalem. Uh, but at that point, kind of, you know, we we figured out how to to work together. We talked very regularly. Uh, then we we continued doing that kind of through telephone calls, through emails. Actually, I, I went to Jerusalem uh, uh, for a couple of weeks at some point. Uh, he came back uh, at various points. Uh, but at that point, you know, I knew how he was thinking about particular problems. He knew how I was thinking. A sort of clear. We'd made some progress and, and kind of had become what seemed to us at least kind of a very exciting uh, set of problems to work on. Thanks. Uh, very interesting. So going from there, how did you find your way to the well now uh, very well used the potential outcome framework and uh, uh, Don Rubin? So uh, Don Rubin played a huge role in your life. With, yeah. No. Uh, no. That, that, uh, it's a, so. That had started kind of with with Josh. Josh had had um, some some uh, regular mail exchanges with with Don. Sort of, I think even when he was was at Harvard, they uh, they exchanged various letters. Uh, and then when he went to Jerusalem, they they kept corresponding. Uh, and so. Josh had kind of shown me some of the the papers, and so I we we were trying to kind of fit these things into the potential outcome framework because it seemed to us a very clever and useful way of avoiding some of the the modeling assumptions that people in economics were were used to making, and so we kind of uh, kept making progress on that, getting it closer to 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 
that framework. Uh, but to, during the first year, I hadn't, and I hadn't actually met uh, Don. He was in the building uh, next to us. Kind of, we were in this uh, in building called Litar Center, the Science Center, where the Statistics Department was was uh, right next door. But I would never actually uh, met him. But then at the point where we we had kind of the key result for the local average treatment effect, uh, I went over to uh, to talk to uh, to Don, and you know he listened. Uh, very politely, more more politely than than maybe you uh, you would expect. Uh, but he didn't really show a huge amount of interest. Uh, but he was, you know, uh, he listened. Uh, we talked for a while. Uh, but then a couple of weeks later, he actually called me and he said, "Well, he was at the the airport in Rome, and he was reading the the paper I'd given him." And he said, "Well, actually, I think you guys, this is this is really interesting. You guys are really doing it all wrong, but it's it's really interesting, uh, and uh, I want to talk more uh, about this. And this this is really exciting. And so then we started talking very regularly, kind of, and uh, kind of we started uh, collaborating. We started a paper with uh, with Josh uh, that came out in JASA. and Don and I kind of wrote a couple more papers uh, together there. Uh, at some point, he said, "Well, you know, we should teach a course on this." Uh, that led to the the course that uh, that Rajiv was talking about. Uh, I, th I think th you know, that was probably the first course, kind of solely devoted to causal inference, kind of uh, uh, at least said, in observational studies. Uh, um, and that that was that was very exciting. It was kind of funny. Uh, that, that was that was partly why it was was very good to be at Harvard. Harvard was very flexible. I went to the chair in the economics department and said uh, I wanted to teach this course with someone in statistics. And chair was great. Sounds good. Just go ahead. The, the registrar's office had a little bit more uh, trouble with the, the course. We wrote this course description uh, and the, the spell checker there changed everything from causal to casual. So the, the whole course description uh, was a little... Uh, nah, Confusing, and uh, no. When I started doing this, the, the, um, it was a very stressful thing because Don wasn't really interested in actually preparing for the course. So we we did it basically week by week, trying to figure out what we would uh, do next week. And the, Don didn't mind that as much as the, but I, I found that very uh, nerve wracking at the time. But it, it turned out to be a great course. And it, uh, lots of interesting work came out of that. Uh, the Rajiv's work with Sarah Waba that, that got published in JASA later, with the, where they, they retrieved the Lalonde data from old tapes uh, and, and made this accessible. It's been a really influential paper. The, another student started this uh, lottery project uh, that I worked on with uh, with Don and, uh, and Bruce Sasserot. Uh, so it just just turned out to be an incredibly interesting course. In fact that we had we had a couple of guest lectures. We had one by by Chuck Mansky. We had Judea Pearl give a guest lecture there. So it, it turned out to be just an incredibly interesting uh, experience uh, and really one that affected not just the, the careers of the students, but really affected my my research uh, uh, and career in a major way. Thanks for these very interesting anecdotes. I'm now handing over to Emma, who's going to ask the next question. Thank you. Hi, Hido. So we've already touched a little bit on some of your work, but throughout your career, you've uh, produced several very influential papers. So we were wondering a bit, what was the process of working on those like? Is it Was it different in any way from working on some papers that didn't end up being so influential? Did you know at the time that they would be so influential or was that a surprise? Yeah, that's, a, the, that's an interesting question. So for, for the local average treatment effect paper, I do have a very vivid memory kind of 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 getting to the the final piece there, and now uh, feeling that that was just really uh, a useful insight, kind of, and that was sort of I felt that was going to be as good as it gets in terms of of doing research. Now, now um, you know, you have to put that in in, in context, sort of. I felt, 
I felt that was as good as it gets kind of relative to the things I'd done before. And that sort of, I, I learned something doing that. And I was, I was uh, we were, Josh and I were both just very pleased at that time. Uh, we felt there was, there really was a clear result there, something that we didn't, didn't know. And we'd been thinking, you know, exposed, it kind of seems like a very, uh, simple result but it took us a long time to get there because we were setting the problem up in a very different way initially that that wasn't really uh working so there there that that is one of the few times where i felt at the time that yes actually you know that that was that was a useful uh insight and you know, I've, that that does happen occasionally it doesn't happen very often uh, kind of often papers start off much more the uh, open-ended and it's it's much more of a gradual uh, uh, thing but that, that was one of the few times where I, where there was really a point where i said okay yeah now here we have we have a we have a clear insight uh, and you know whether that's going to be influential or not and i i don't think i was really thinking of it in in those terms because at that time there were very few people doing causal inference uh, and so there wasn't really it wasn't really clear there was a market for that to be uh, to be influential, but I do remember showing that. Uh, so at that point, Josh was in Israel, uh, and so showing the the paper to uh, uh, to Gary Chamberlain, and you know, he he was impressed, and so that was that, uh, and in the end, when I, when we made contact with uh, with Don, he was impressed. Uh, so it did feel fairly early on. That there was an insight there, even though it clearly took a long time for the the result to to get more of an audience. Uh, but thanks, Hido. I'm gonna take up the next question. So, bringing you back to your time at Harvard, you already mentioned that um, being at Harvard gave you a lot of flexibility in teaching the course that you wanted to teach. But we wanted to further touch on that, and we wanted to hear from you from um, other influences and, and experiences that you had uh, during your time as an assistant professor at Harvard and how that influenced your course? Yeah, so the, at that time, I didn't really uh, have much to compare, compare that to. Uh, so the, Harvard's kind of a funny place in that they, they tend to leave people alone a lot to do their their research uh, there, there wasn't uh, a lot of of uh, of mentoring going on it was kind of you know you would seek out individual uh, people they they would give you a lot of freedom to do whatever you, um, you wanted but you kind of had to make the the most of it and so for me that turned out to work uh, incredibly well that was incredibly fortunate to have that one year of uh, overlap with uh, with Josh Angrist uh, that turned out to be incredibly influential. It, I was very fortunate in having having uh, Dom Rubin in the in the next building and him being at a you know, again that the sort of there's a bunch of fortunate parts to that. I think he was a it was also at a stage where he was slightly frustrated with the lack of traction the some of the causal stuff was uh, was getting uh, and by connecting with the economist that really helped build a bigger audience for for some of the the course of work he's done i mean it, you know obviously it was uh the it would have the, you know it was becoming more influential already but this this really helped him get more traction with uh with the economist and similarly in the economics department gary chamberlain turned out to be incredibly good senior colleague for me in terms of kind of telling me to talk to some of the people and and being very supportive of the of the work I was doing so uh, even though I, I ended up not getting tenure there it, it was a great experience uh, for me research wise and it, it's, it's really the most important the it was really the formative part of my career Great, thank you, Ido. So I'm continuing 
uh, now about some of your work and some of your thoughts on kind of methodology and practice in causal inference. So we've actually received several questions from the audience in preparation for this about kind of methodologies developing causal inference that don't receive a lot of attention maybe in practice. Um, so first, I guess I'd like to ask you, do you have opinions on some methods? So what do you think some methods are perhaps that are not often used in practice, but should be and why, <laughs> or of some gap that you see that should be filled? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure exactly kind of how how these things work but it, it's, it's a couple of of things uh you know i spent some time at uh yeah, at amazon uh, i spent some time at amazon over the years and so there they have all these uh what they call leadership principles uh and one of them is uh is working backwards kind of from the from the customers and so uh, i think kind of if you want to do methodology it's very important to connect and engage deeply with people doing actually analyzing data and doing empirical work. It's it's no good to kind of trying to come up with general methodologies. I think it's very difficult to come up with general methodologies and then go take them to people doing empirical work, saying, "Well, here this is you should adopt this uh, this methodology." Yeah, and so the, I've always found it incredibly satisfying and helpful kind of to just directly talk and engage with the people doing empirical work kind of early on that was uh, with josh josh angris kind of we started off thinking about the the draft lottery paper and what was what was going on there and trying to make make sense of that uh, and the, some of the the most satisfying work subsequently kind of has been the similarly kind of talking to people doing empirical work and about the, the specific problems they're working on so that any methodologies you come up with sort of have direct the relevance uh, so I was, was very fortunate to have Raj Chetty as my colleague kind of first at Berkeley then at Harvard and, and for a while at Stanford uh, and so he's be you know he does incredibly high quality empirical work and it's just very useful to talk to people like that and kind of seeing where they they feel a little uncomfortable, where they still have questions, uh, and use that to motivate uh, work, and so that that's uh, that helps ensure that these methods do get traction. In some sense, the my time at some of the tech companies has similarly been very inspirational. Uh, talking to the people there, kind of seeing what questions uh, they have rather than than trying to get the questions out of uh, reading papers in uh, in econometrica or uh, or jasa but kind of start with with the the papers and research that is actually analyzing data and it, in econometrics the sort of and I, I think that's much less so now but there used to be a little bit more the talking down to the empirical people uh kind of the econometricians complaining that the, the empirical work wasn't wasn't very high quality without really engaging with the the people to actually try to improve the work and it you know especially doing this across uh, fields you you do want to start being trying to understand what people are actually doing you know and kind of being respectful for their the people doing empirical work are not stupid they're 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 making choices and often they're very, they, they may not articulate them very clearly, but they're very well thought through. There's, there's a building on, on long traditions. Uh, and so trying to, to engage with them constructively. Uh, that's sort of, sort of where my early experiences with Don were very impressive. Uh, again, there was among statisticians, there was often an attitude that uh, econometrics wasn't very interesting um, and that. Uh, it wasn't really worth engaging with those problems uh, but don was 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 willing to think very hard about why the problems we were looking at differed from the ones he was looking at and whether there were insights to to be gotten at some level the work we did kind of there with josh and and, and don uh, lots of people could have figured those things out if they 
kind of read these different literatures and thought about them and kind of done the you know part of the, partly the translation uh, to figure out what the similarities were between these problems and what the insights from these different literatures are. So I think often when when some of these methods don't get used, it's because people don't don't put up put in enough efforts to really engage with people in these these fields to make these things uh, uh, work and make it clear to people in these other fields why these methods may be uh, may be useful. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Shinya. Uh, is uh, Hido? So this is a uh, question about sensitivity analysis. So uh, you have a article back in twenty um, uh, three in the American Economic Review that proposed a very popular method for sensitivity analysis, but that doesn't seem to be the uh, a, a general case for for this field. It seems that sensitivity analysis is one of those uh, areas where everyone says we should uh, uh, do a sensitivity analysis, but it's really done in practice. So can you share some thoughts on that, including uh, what challenges have to be overcome for those tools to be used, used more yeah. often? Yeah, yeah sure. That, that's kind of an interesting area. So I mean, you know, the 2003 papers and proceedings paper wasn't all that big a contribution. I really it built very directly on the, the work Rosenbaum and, and Ruben had done. Uh, but I do think it's a very interesting area. I mean, you know, in the seminar here, we had this the presentation by Sinelli and Hazlitt uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and it's sort of it's curious why some of that has not gotten more traction in uh, in practice. I said I, I've been talking to Dominique about that a little bit uh, a couple of months. I was talking to Dominique about that a little bit a couple of months ago. And so one one way to, to formulate this sort of suppose you're uh, um, you're analyzing data and you have to present the results to a decision maker. Someone's going to decide actually to to implement an intervention or not. So this, it's fairly clear that the first things you would report are some estimate of the average effect of the the intervention. And some some measure of the uncertainty, standard error, and so the, um, it seems very curious that we that there is a huge amount of agreement what the first two numbers are that we should report. But now suppose that the decision maker actually says, "Well, you know, I'm not stupid. I can. I don't want to see the whole data set, but I want to know a little bit more. What else can you tell me about how how credible you think these results are? How reliable they are?" And we, we don't really have much agreement on what the third number should be, or the fourth or the fifth, or what the next couple of numbers should be that you should report. And it's sort of clear that you know, if there's more room to do more, to do something beyond just the point estimate and the standard error, that would be very useful. And I, I think part of the, the answer, clearly one of the next few numbers has to be something to do with sensitivity analysis. But I, I don't know exactly, but somehow we don't seem to have been able to settle on what, what the best way of reporting that is. Uh, and it, you know, when I've been in these conversations where people are reporting, so again, at, at some of the tech companies, when people are reporting these statistical analysis, after seeing the point estimate and the standard error, you know, people may talk about statistical significance and maybe that's not really all that relevant, but it's sort of, there's no clear consensus on what the next things are to report beyond that. And that, that seems very curious. And I, th I think at some point we should, we should be able to come to some consensus there. Rajiv, um, do you want to ask the yeah. next question? So, um, Hito, Rajiv again. So this is a question or version of it, which was um, uh, submitted by Fiametta Menchetti. She was asking um, about sort of Bayesian causal inference, right? So you have early, you know, some of the early work with Don, um, analysis statistics was explicitly Bayesian, the back to the, the course that you taught with Don, right? So it seemed like there was kind of a very Bayesian slant coming in from, from Don. Um, and of course, you know, then you had the work with Gary as well. Do you have any sort of thoughts on the future 
of a Bayes model-based inference in causal analysis? Is that is that going to be one of these things that that sort of is intellectually sort of very elegant but doesn't get used very much, or do you think it has has some some greater sort of future? Yeah, I, th I think. Uh... But there, I sort of, I always thought it would become more important. And it's, it's kind of been curious to me why it hasn't gotten more traction. I mean, it, I, th I think even then, perhaps even more now, um, where a lot of the causal inference is used very directly for making decisions, a Bayesian perspective is, uh, is clearly very useful. And you see, you see that a little bit. Uh, I've seen in some of these settings uh, where lots and lots of experiments are being done, uh, where it actually makes sense to find some framework for combining the experiments. You see empirical based type methods becoming more uh, prominent. Uh, and so I see a big role in practice for, for Bayesian methods. Uh, I've always felt that in the econometric literature, one thing that was that was holding things back a little bit was that the a lot of the Bayesian work didn't lend itself for the format that you see in a lot of econometrics papers, kind of with theorems and proofs. Uh, it was less about asymptotic uh, properties of the type that that are very popular in econometrics papers. Uh, so it's a little harder to get things published now. These days, I have a little bit more control over those things, so so I hope to see more Bayesian work in uh, in causal inference because uh, I think it makes it makes a lot of sense. And this particular settings, like the settings with many uh, experiments, where it clearly has has substantial advantages over some of the the regular uh, frequentist analyses. Thanks. I think Ying is going to go next with future directions and thoughts. Hi, Kilo. Uh, here is a question from uh, our audience, Helmut Wasserbecker. Uh, so it is a question about reverse causation. He says a lot of progress has been achieved for determining the effect from a given course, which we also call it treatment or intervention. So the reverse question, what is or the uh, courses of an observed effect seems much harder. Would you agree with statement? And what is your perspective on this angle of causality? Yes, yes, I, I totally agree with that. I, um, I think those questions are very interesting and they, they, they're clearly very hard. You know, so one version of, of that question is the sort of in some of the tech company settings, there was a prediction made that some outcome would be be x and we see that it's not x but only the 50 percent of x and the question is why did that happen why was the forecast why was the prediction of is because the, the shipments were slow is it because the weather was was bad is it because there was a fire here is it because there was a, a ship stuck in the Suez canal kind of but it it's very hard it's often very hard to answer those questions because you can go down as as far as you want and it's not quite clear when you have an answer that is that is sat satisfactory sort of i at some point i i uh, andrew galman and i spent some time thinking about it and we have we have this half finished paper the on reverse causality but we never really finished it because partly we weren't quite satisfied with where we got into and it wasn't quite clear how to to finish that but I think th I think it's a very important uh, set of questions um, and we need to find better ways of uh, of answering those questions but it it's kind of one of these areas where I think it's very interesting but I'm not quite sure exactly how uh, what direction we're going to get more satisfactory solutions. Uh, if if we one way of doing it is is by starting off by just listing all the potential answers that are, that are there, but it doesn't seem very very satisfactory because then it's it goes back to really answering 
just a whole bunch of forward causal questions. Uh, and I, no. so I don't I don't quite know how to, how to get to a good answer there. Um, okay, uh, so next question is about uh, different frameworks um, of causal, causal inference. So in a recent paper, um, you compared the potential outcome and graphical approaches to causality and their relative merits for economics. Obviously, this debate has lasted for many years, not only in economics, but in many other uh, scientific disciplines. A seemingly related wrangling in economics is reduced form versus structural models. So do you have any further thoughts on these contrasting approaches that you'd like to share with us here? Yeah, you know, the, the, this is a tricky question. So no matter what I say, I'm going to get into trouble uh, here. So um, yeah, so I, I, I wrote that paper uh, because I thought it was important for economists to get more exposure to these, uh, these graphical models. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I actually looked up that, that paper yesterday to to make sure i quoted it right so it's somewhere i wrote that i highly recommend the book of why and the more technical and comprehensive 2000 book for anyone who's interested in causal inference and statistics and that should include pretty much anyone doing empirical work in social sciences these days so but i think i think that the the graphical the structural causal model approach is very important uh, and people should should uh, read that literature uh, very carefully uh, the the part kind of uh, where i was a little more more skeptical was the the view that it's kind of this is the only way of thinking about uh, causal questions i think there's kind of lots of parts of the what i view as part of the causal literature where the graphical models don't really uh, help very much uh, there's a big literature on regression discontinuity uh, where I've not seen uh, a lot of insights coming from uh, from that, and similarly with the synthetic control um, literature. So th I think the graphical models are very good, first of all, at visualizing a lot of the, the assumptions, and second, um, the, the, the mathematical framework associated with it is very good at establishing identification in a particular class of uh, of models, um, and so that um, that's very helpful for for lots of problems. Now, similarly, kind of with the debate between reduced form and, uh, and structural modeling, uh, kind of as I uh, mentioned before, the starting point for for kind of Josh and to some extent, David Carr uh, as well, was this uh, the state of the literature in the 1980s where people in economics had articulated a lot of unease with the, the state, the credibility of empirical work. And so uh, in the, the lectures we gave last, uh, last month, all three of us mentioned these two papers, by, one by Ed Lemer, let's take the con out of econometrics, and the Lalonde paper. And kind of both of those made very clear that there was a lot of empirical work kind of using sophisticated statistical modeling that just wasn't really working, that wasn't doing the, the job. In particular, the Lima paper is incredibly well written. It's, it's very clever, it's very witty. So I highly recommend that. But it was very clear that uh, there was a problem. And the uh, the problem was sort of partly in people being willing to make lots of assumptions without it being very clear how important they were and what effect that had on the on the results. Uh, and so the the what, what Josh and Steve Pisco called the credibility revolution came out of of that trying to make make some of these the the results more credible. And you know, I think none of us really like the the term reduced form, and it's not really. To, uh, historically, it's not really, it doesn't make sense to describe instrumental variables methods as reduced uh, form. They're, they're part of the structural side of things. Uh, uh, but it, the term is kind of being used a little bit in a derogatory uh, way. As so David Card likes to call this design based, or uh, I think I typically use causal uh, uh, methods. 
but it was it was all motivated by trying to make the empirical work more credible and trying to have assumptions that you could actually um, argue about. Now that doesn't take away that is a big there's an important role for for economic uh, theory, and that that motivates the instrumental variables assumptions uh, that motivates the assumptions kind of in simultaneous equations uh, settings as in the paper I did with Josh and Katie Grady on the on the fish market. Uh, and economic theory is even important in uh, in experimental design. Nowadays, there's kind of a lot of really interesting work on experimental design where people bring in uh, some economic uh, theory. Stefan Varga, uh, Evan Monroe and co-authors have done some interesting work there. Uh, I just posted a paper on archive where we're looking at experimental designs in settings where you have multiple populations and you uh, try to take care of interference between units uh, through more, much more complex randomization schemes that ultimately kind of rely on, on economic models for how uh, units interact. So th I think these uh, divisions are not very helpful. They're, they're overblown and they're, they're obscuring the fact that really what it's all about is trying to get credible uh, and robust uh, inferences uh, uh, for what are often causal questions. Thanks. So we have another question uh, by a member of the audience, Fiumetta Manchetti. So um, I really like this question, so I look forward to your answer. So the, the global pandemic has had the central role of scientific research. At the same time, the drift towards anti-science is present and dangerous as never before. Do you think this is a temporary effect of the pandemic crisis, or is it a major concern in the future? And how do you think the scientific community can lead with this major issue? Yeah, no, that's a very that's a very hard question. I mean, I I do worry that that some of this is uh, more longer term. So, so I mean, it, and it's you know it, it's clearly not just in the, the U.S., but it's in other countries as well. If I you know if I look at the, the Netherlands, there there's also a lot of uh, debate and opposition to various government policies trying to deal with the the pandemic. And if you compare that to earlier episodes where there were vaccine policies for polio or where there were uh, government mandated safety rules about wearing helmets on, uh, on motorbikes. In the earlier days, it was very rare to see kind of very organized opposition to these, uh, these policies. Um, and, and nowadays it seems very easy for, for people um, who oppose these measures to try to actually organize more systematic uh, uh, opposition to these uh, these things, and I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure how how we're going to get out of uh, of these things. It sort of it seems clear to me in the case of the pandemic that we may disagree on uh, what particular policies are helpful, whether we should be wearing masks here or there or everywhere when people exactly should get uh, get uh, vaccinated and which groups should be get vaccinated and in what order. We can disagree on these specific policies, but it, it does seem clear to me that we need to agree on a process for making these decisions and then stick with it because we can't have everybody making their own decisions because for infectious diseases, that doesn't really work. There's externalities. Uh, and so we need to somehow delegate the decision-making uh, process, and we don't, you know, we seem to have a hard time letting the the science uh, be helpful there. It's sort of clear when these questions are hard, when there's not immediate consensus in the scientific community. It's going to be very easy for people to pick and choose, and then argue that that science is on their side. Uh, but how we deal with that, I think, and, um, I think that's a, that's a big uh, challenge. You know, at the point where the science isn't completely clear, we may still need to make decisions that some people are unhappy with. 
and so the, we need to find a way of, uh, of letting the science be clear on what we know and what the uncertainty is there, but then be able to get to some consensus on what how to actually move forward. Great, thanks. So uh, we're coming now to a question for like the, the new generation. So currently, because the interest in the field is surging, there are a lot of new young people entering the field. And I just wanted to hear whether you have any advice for uh, students today, uh, like what should they work on or how should they work on these questions? Yeah, so um, that, that's another tricky question there. So for my own experience, um, well, so, so I, th I think causal inference now is in a in a great state. When I was working on on some of these problems in the early '90s, uh, it was in some sense a very lonely uh, field. And there were a couple of people, but they were they were all very spread out, uh, and I was uh, interacting with them wasn't always uh, easy. I was very fortunate, kind of uh, having Josh and uh, and Don at Harvard at the same time there. Uh, but now clearly it's it's a field that's doing incredibly well we have there's lots of conferences there's this new society that's been being uh, formed and it's what is incredibly nice is that it's it's so interdisciplinary and yeah? that is these problems and methods coming in from all these uh, these different uh, areas and so what i would encourage people is kind of to to listen to the uh, the people doing doing empirical work actually analyzing the data and kind of seeing what what types of problems they're working on where they may be stuck or where there may be things that are uh, that are possible to to improve one of the things i'm working on at the moment uh, with a student uh, david ritzwell are here at, at stanford was inspired by um, actually the interview esther duflo did uh, in this seminar uh, a year and a half ago, when she talked about the what to do if you have lots of different outcomes. Uh, so you suppose that you do a particular experiment, you may be interested in the one or two outcomes, but you have the ability to observe lots of different uh, outcomes. Uh, what should you do with those? Uh, what role do they they play? And one, one concern that came up was that, in fact, they could make things worse because now you have to adjust for multiple testing rather than kind of look at all these, these different outcomes. But at the same time, you see in practice that that's what people do when I see some of the experiments that uh, the, the tech companies do, they often observe, they often record lots of different outcomes. So what's, what's really the role of that? Uh, how does that change the way you're making uh, decisions? Uh, and so having these, having questions like that, that come up in conversations and, uh, and seminars from, from people who were actually working in the trenches, who are actually analyzing these data and collecting these data, I think is a great way to uh, get inspired and doing, doing more things. As sort of a general area, I think um, experimental design, uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening in experimental design. I think there's a lot of interesting questions about combining observational and experimental data. You can kind of think of experiment of experiments as helping you analyze, answer very specific questions very well. But there's lots more questions we're interested in and we're not going to be able to do separate experiments for all these different things. So how could we design experiments to make, make them as useful as possible for answering general questions uh, uh, beyond just the simple, uh, beyond the direct decision that may motivate them? And I, I think there's also much more to be done on settings with, with complex uh, patterns of interference between units and that's that's one of the places where having theory, having very theories, various theories of uh, of human behavior is going to be helpful uh, for thinking through what restrictions to put on uh, on on these patterns of uh, interference. All right, wonderful. So actually, to kind of put you on the spot at the end, we received some questions in the Q&A and we thought we'd finish up with one of those. So I'll read the question from Richard Burke. 
<clears throat> so any ideas about how to get from the results of a single study to what we really want to know about how the intervention will perform if subsequently implemented? Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, the, um, that's a great question. So in some sense, the way I think about that is the, um, a little bit along the lines of the, the end of the, the answer to the last question. So the, um, we're interested in, in a whole bunch of possible uh, interventions and changes in the, in the environment. And we are interested in the effects kind of on, on long-term outcomes uh, and things we don't directly measure. And so what the uh, experiments can help us by answer, answering very specific questions, but what you really need to build is kind of a framework that you can put all the answers for these different, uh, for these different questions in together so that you can actually exploit the fact that the previous experiment answered this question and now this experiment tells you about another part of the, the problem. And so you may, may want to build some big structural model. You may want to build some big graphical model. Uh, we want to have some structure that you can put these things in together and that tell you which particular experiments would be helpful for, uh, the, for answering the, the bigger questions beyond the, the direct questions that these experiments are going to answer. The experiments are going to be incredibly good at answering these, these very narrow questions uh, very well. But in many cases, we do need to use multiple experiments to then build up to an answer for, for a more complex uh, uh, question. Because uh, validating things there is uh, it's going to be very tricky. And so I think there's still going to be lots of questions about how to actually uh, do that in practice and how to do that in a, in a credible way. But I think, I think those are very interesting challenges. All right, thank you so much. So uh, now we're getting to the, like, to the final question. And I know that this is a question that uh, some people in the panel, from the panel here are waiting for. So this is a question about your chickens. So some people might know it. You have a chicken coop in your in your backyard. So the question that we have is, has this chicken coop influenced your research? Uh, what's the story behind that? Uh, have you conducted some experiments or observational study on them? All right. Yeah. So so I can actually walk out and you can I can share the the um, I can show off the chickens. But so in terms of the the research at some point one of the kids was interested for a school project to learn more about the packing order of the of the chicken so we have nine chickens uh, and so for a while took uh, the videos every morning to see the order in which the chickens came out to uh, see if there was a pattern there and there was some there was there was a pattern there, but it wasn't. Uh, we didn't really. Uh, and so I, I think we we did establish the packing order. Uh, so now let me just put it there. All right. So now I'm going to. Oops. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so there they're coming out. So, so what are the names? Um, this is Suits, the, oops, the, the white and black one here. Uh -huh. And there, that's Viola, the one we could actually uh, caught by a, a coyote, but survived. And then um, there's Jack and Corey and a couple more. All right, let me get the video back. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, thank you so much, Rido. This was uh, absolutely fantastic. Also, thank you so much, uh, Rajiv, uh, for, uh, for helping us uh, collect the questions, also conducting the interview. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for joining. So uh, next week, we're going to have Zach Mukherjee from Cambridge, who will talk about 
a machine learning approach for causal structure estimation in high dimensions. Uh, thank you all for joining. Hope you have a great week and uh, yeah, see you next time. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. Bye. All right. Great to see everybody. Yeah.